Hello, everybody. Welcome to this quick lecture on procedure MacGyverings. So today we're not going to talk about how to do the procedure. I'm sure that you're going to go over that a couple of different times in a couple of different videos. And you're also going to be practicing with us in class. What I want to talk about is a little bit more specific to each individual procedure. And that is, I don't think that you can really master a procedure unless you know how to fix something if it's gone wrong or how to recover if it's gone wrong. I think that's the real definition of mastering a procedure. So that's kind of what I want to talk about today. And I also want to encourage you to think about other problems as you learn each procedure. If one step goes wrong, do you know what to do to fix it if you're the only person in the hospital who can? So let's talk about a couple of options. We're only gonna go over five procedures today. Um, these are the ones listed here. And that's just to keep everything short, sweet, and simple. All right, so first of all, let's go over some sutures and staples. So obviously this is not a life-threatening procedure, but it's one that we do most. So we need to talk about a couple of complications. The first is that when you're initially starting and you're doing a suture or a stapling, you don't actually close the wound. Either the staple doesn't get both sides of the wound or the suture rips and pulls through the tissue, either because the tissue is too thin and you need a bigger bite or you don't have a large enough suture size. So if you keep having tears through your suture, then that means that you need a larger size, a bigger thread if you will. Okay, now you can see some of these pictures here that we have as examples. You can see that this is a stapled wound from a leg surgery. Now we in the emergency department, we almost never do this. We almost always use staples for the scalp only. Um, but you can see in this particular picture that it's very messily done and that there's probably too many staples here. We're going to get to that in just a minute. Um, we also want to point out that this picture on the bottom is an infected suture area. This is on a chin and you can see how wet and you could probably push on it and you might get a little bit of pus coming out of it. If your sutures or somebody else's sutures that present are infected, something like this, they need to be cut out immediately. Even if that leaves a bigger gaping area, we don't wanna contain that infection inside the wound. So you wanna cut out all those sutures or staples or whatever they are. Unless of course it's a deep surgery and then you need to call in the surgeon. Um, next is not putting in enough suture or perhaps um, using what I call the gaping rule. So you can see in this picture up here that this person doesn't have enough sutures in place. So if I was to take my two fingers, gloved of course, and put them on either side of the wound and put, apply gentle pressure, if the wound gapes open, then that means that there's not enough suture, you need to add more. If however, it stays kind of closed, then it's enough and you're good to go. You can tell that this area of the wound right here is gaping without us even pushing on it. So that needs more suture. Um, and finally, we got to talk about picking the right size and type and um, whether you're going to pick sutures or staples. So let's talk about that here in this slide. Um, so you can see that we have two different kinds of made sutures. We have non-absorbable and absorbable. Most of us in the emergency department are gonna use non-absorbable and most of us are gonna use the monofilament proline. That's just because it's the widest available and that's what almost everyone uses. When we're talking about sutures in the emergency department, most people assume it's a proline. Proline is also really hard to work with because it's almost a single uh, string of plastic fiber, which if you can imagine your hands are bloody or they're bleeding quite a bit, this is a really hard suture to tie. It's a really hard one to work with. So it's worth your time to practice with these if you're at all uncomfortable. I'm also going to let you know that if you're using absorbable, most likely you're going to be using a Vicryl. Now, Vicryl typically takes about 10 to 14 days to absorb, depending on where it is in the body. And as it's absorbing, it gets really itchy. You should probably tell the patient about that so they're ready, or the parents, if you will. Um, absorbable suture is almost exclusively used for either non-reliable patients, like homeless drunks who are probably not going to come back to get it, 
taken out or in pediatrics who you're not sure you're gonna be able to hold them down long enough to take out the suture later. Most of the time though, most people do best with proline. Now these are the two most common, but you will see all of these others that are available. I will let you know right now that silk and also uh, gut in, in particular, chromic gut is the most inflammatory, which means that it, on top of already having a cut, this patient's inflammatory response is going to react to the sutures that you place in it. So it's at a way higher likelihood of causing scarring and co poor cosmetic output. So in general, I wouldn't be using silk unless you're putting in a chest tube and I wouldn't be using any kind of gut unless your surgeon directly is the one who's telling you to do that. And if you get a choice, try not to use the chromic gut. I would almost always go with proline or vicryl for every patient that I treat, and I'm almost always using non-absorbable. I also want you to take a check out of this little man here. You can see that um, at different parts of the body, we typically use certain sizes, and typically we have a certain amount of time that it needs to be removed. This has to do with the healing properties of that part of the body. So you can imagine that if you're in a 23 year old male who's cut his fingers welding or something, he, he probably needs to come back in seven to 10 days and he's probably gonna use a 5-0 suture. However, if it's really deep cuts or if this person is also a diabetic who never takes their insulin, he probably needs a full 14 days and maybe you should think about a 4-0 or a 3-0. So you have to take into consideration that these are more of a guideline rather than a rule. You can also see from this picture here that staples are almost exclusively used for the scalp. Again, in the ER, it's considered poor form to use them with almost any other position. Uh, this is another um, general picture of all the different sizes and where to use them. This one is the surgical one, but the most common size that's usually available in the ER is a size three. As long as your suture isn't breaking all the time, you don't need to focus as much on the size as you do the type and the number of sutures you place. The right answer to the number of sutures that you place or the number of staples that you place is as little as possible. I really want to make sure that everybody knows that suturing doesn't have to be ni nice, tight, very evenly placed sutures. While that's a great way to learn, when you're a little bit more advanced and you're actually doing these lacerations, especially if they're not a straight line, you don't have to put it in um, to look pretty. What you have to do is just put it in just enough to where they don't need any more and you're not gaping in any area of the wound. Okay, let's move on to intubation. So intubation can go wrong in a lot of ways. I'm not gonna cover all of them, but I want you to know some of the basics. So. Once you place the tube, you want to know when you get your chest x-ray where the tube should be. So what you're looking for is going to be in this bottom picture down here. We're going to be looking for about two centimeters above the carina, and that is the appropriate placement of the tube. If it's a little bit more, a little less, I don't really care. But if it's way high up or way low down, we're going to need to move that tube and usually respiratory will do that for you, but if not, you're gonna be responsible for moving your own tube. So this is something that you should know where your tube is. And this is what you should look for when you're looking at this x-ray after, after you're done intubating. This picture here is showing how this person has right main stemmed them. You can see that almost all of the air is gonna go into this lung and almost none of it is gonna go into this lung. All right, so we've covered where the placement should be. Now, I also want you to know that your placement could be perfect, but the patient could start decompensating after going to a CT or after being moved, say, from the EMS stretcher to the bed. This is the most common place where the tube gets dislodged or pulled from the throat. So if a patient is starting to decompensate, especially after being moved or jostled around, you should think about checking the placement of that tube. And that should be probably the very first thought that you have. You can fix main, right main stemming too deep any day, but you can't fix it if it's esophageal placed or if it's basically not in their trachea at all, then you have to restart all over and intubate them all over again. 
So it's really important to think about this, know the placement and know some of the downfalls. I also wanted to go ahead and show you that this picture here is a bougie where they have placed an ET tube around the bougie. So if you go through and you put a bougie, which is almost like smaller than a pencil into the appropriate spot, let's say it's because it's a kid or they're having airway swelling, or for some reason you're just not able to get it in the hole, you can use a bougie and then you could advance your ET tube over that bougie and intubate them appropriately. Now, once you immediately upon intubation, right, you've gone through the back of their throat and you've intubated the trachea, whether it was hard or not, you did a good job, it's in the right place, but boom, their heart rate goes down to 50 or 40 or 30. This is reflex bradycardia, right? Because that's where those carotid bodies are in our throat. So we have accidentally stimulated the vagus nerve causing bradycardia. We're going to talk a lot about that in the cardiopulm section. But when this happens, you don't need to do anything about it. Give them two to five minutes and the heart rate will go right back up. So don't be pushing any meds or drugs. Don't freak out and panic. Don't dump a bunch of fluid in them. Just give them a little bit of time. Again, two to five minutes, that's usually all you need. If it stays lower than that for a longer period of time, you need to look for other problems. And then the last is you can't get the airway. Now I'm sure that we're gonna be talking about this a lot in real life. So if you can't get the airway for any reason, there's tons of different options that you can use. But the important ones are call for help early. It is not a pride game. This is playing with somebody's life. And the last thing that you wanna do is have somebody die because you didn't call for anesthesia or for your MD to come help you. So if you can't get it after the first one or you're worried even before you walk in this room that this patient's gonna be hard, go get help. Next is try something new. If you have tried the putting the tube down once or twice, that is all the attempts you get. If you have done it twice and been failing, you have to either do something new or get someone new. That's it. You don't get multiple attempts. Even if the, the SATs are great, the more times that you hit against the trachea and the esophagus, the more that they're gonna get airway swelling and inflammation and the harder it's gonna be. So please don't sit there and keep doing it over and over and over and being like, I don't know why I'm getting not getting this. This is again, not a pride thing. This is you give yourself two attempts and then you either have to try something new, like a new equipment, a new approach. Maybe you use the GlideScope, maybe you use direct, maybe you're using a bougie, I don't care. You gotta try something new or you gotta go get somebody new. Now, I do wanna talk about, oops, sorry. I do wanna talk about intubating a difficult airway. And again, I know you're gonna be having multiple lectures on this, both in this semester and next semester. But what I want you to hear about is there's all different kinds of airways. You can see from this slide how many and different complications you can get. You can get airways that are completely closed or completely swollen, completely infected or totally bloody. You can get so many different views. So a couple of different things. Make sure you have your suction there so you can suction away the area and actually see what you're doing. Don't guess. Don't do a blind and think that you have it, okay? Next is consider not using your glide scope. If you go down and you see nothing but blood or you see nothing but vomit, obviously a camera is not gonna be the best choice. This is why you need to practice your direct. So maybe that's time to get out your handle and do a direct. Definitely you're gonna need suction, but you're also gonna need to know that timing is important on this. The more difficult of an airway it is on your first attempt, the way worse it's gonna be on your sixth or seventh or eighth. Even if they bag fine, they may not bag fine forever, especially if they're swelling or if there's a large amount of vomit or blood coming up. The next option is you can always intubate the esophagus on purpose. I had a gentleman who was um, vomiting up a massive amount of blood and we couldn't see it because every time I would go in there, more and more would come out. So I took the tube and I intubated his esophagus, turned the tube to the side, got another tube, and then I was able to intubate the airway knowing that all of the blood and vomit and whatever else is coming out the tube on the side and I can see what's going on with the airway at least long enough to intubate. Something to consider. I also want you to know that the um, 
the more scary this is, the more that if you see this, you need to call for help and that you really have a very limited amount of time. I think most of you guys already know this at this point, but um, it's going to be hard to bag a patient who's bleeding or who's vomiting because you're going to shove that right back into their lungs and cause an aspiration. So this makes this patient even more urgent and this should definitely be a sphincter kind of a situation. <laughs> Next is central lines. So a lot can go wrong with central lines as well. Again, I just wanted to go over a quick brief understanding. So one of the things that can go wrong with a central line is we most of the time like to do either an IJ or a subclavian. And if we're doing something up here in the neck or in the thoracic area, our lungs go up above, right up here above our clavicles. So it is possible to puncture a lung and cause a pneumothorax up here in the throat. You can see how low this needle is going into this guy's neck. And all it has to take is just a little tiny puncture to cause a pneumothorax. You're probably gonna do it at least once in your career. So be ready, know that it's not necessarily your fault, but we need to be conscious and aware of it and waiting and watching for it. Next is an accidental carotid or femoral artery puncture. So when you're in the neck, you could accidentally hit the artery. Now some patients, usually the patients who are getting a central line need blood and need IV access. So maybe if you hit the artery, you gotta first notice it. So you know that you're gonna have arterial bleeding, which is going to be a gush or a giant line coming out of the needle rather than a slow trickle. Now, there are a few exceptions to this. I want you to know that patients who are on pressors, especially who are fluid down, are going to have pulsatile uh, veins because of the pressors. So that's going to complicate your situation, something to know about in advance. However, um, if you have it in there, go ahead and get the blood, but if you know for sure this is an artery, you need to hold pressure on it for at least a full 60 seconds. Otherwise, the patient's going to get a large hematoma and you're definitely not going to be able to go back in that spot. Next, one of the most common problems with central lines is wire problems. So you get it in the right place and then you're starting to thread the wire and suddenly you can't thread it. And what you got to do then is you got to twist that um, wire, and I, that's one of my secrets, is to kind of twist and push at the same time. Sometimes that will help get bypass the area. Next is I actually lower my needle down to be more perpendicular with the vein. If it's up and um, I guess more parallel with the vein, sorry. If it's perpendicular to the vein, it's not gonna work. If it's parallel with the vein, it's gonna do better. So decrease the angle of your needle and that's gonna help you out with threading that wire. If your wire kinks and you can't advance it anymore, you're gonna have to pull out the wire because kinked wires will not thread. So you might have to take out the wire and turn it around, make sure you're still in that vein and then put it in from the other end. That's another secret that I learned. The, another big common complication is if you're threading the wire and you didn't notice, but all of a sudden, boom, the patient goes into VTAC and they might start even complaining of chest pain. What you've done is you've actually touched or tickled the ventricular muscle with your wire. So it's gone in too deep and you need to pull back the wire at least about this much and then you can continue with your procedure. Usually the VTAC will stop immediately, the pain will go away for the patient, and you'll just move on. No drugs, no coding, nothing needed. Um, next, if you accidentally lose the wire, some people don't keep a hold of it during the procedure, and that wire actually floats down into the heart. That can cause your patient to code. Never hold this as a secret and code the patient and don't tell anybody because this is something that's reversible, but you're gonna to have to call a physician or maybe vascular or surgery to come get the wire out, which can save this patient's life. So admit your mistake and at least the patient will live, we hope. Next is an air embolism. Now, I know that you guys, most of you at least have been nurses, but you know that a few bubbles in the line aren't gonna kill this patient. 
But as you're putting in a central line, sometimes people forget to suck back or they already have a whole bunch of air in the syringes that they're using. Remember that a little bit over 10 cc's is enough to kill a person. So we don't want to inject any air into the line if possible. If this patient codes because of an air embolism, other than coding them for a longer amount of time and hoping they get through it, there's really not a lot we can do for this patient. Next, if you have secured the line and everything is ready, but you can't get the lines to flush. Now let's say you can't get any of the lines to flush. I would be really worried that you're in the wrong place. I would maybe get out the ultrasound or call and order the CT scan and see where we are. Don't just pull the line because you don't know what you've just dilated, okay? Do not pull the line. That said, let's say it's just one. Two of them flush, but one of them doesn't. You might be up against a wall or a valve, or you might be not quite all the way in. So what you can do is you can twist the, the central line at the base, or you can pull it back just a little bit, and sometimes that'll make a big difference. Next is, if you put the central line in the wrong place. Now, here's some examples of central line or IJ placement specifically. The central line is supposed to tolerate or supposed to terminate. I don't know why I said tolerate um, at the left SVC. So you can see that it needs to be located right above or even right below, right down here, that right atria, right? So we are putting in medicine right above the heart. If it's a little higher, it's not a terrible loss. You can still use the line, but what if it's really out of place? So these two x-rays are pictures of it really being out of place. So this one you're gonna notice comes down and then loops in a circle around. That's not right. Now again, we're not gonna pull this line completely out because we've already dilated it. What it's done is it's gone into the innominate artery right here, and that's not a big deal. You could actually pull it back by about this much to where it would terminate maybe right here or right here, and then you could use that line and you would be fine. However, this one over here, you can see the line comes down and then makes this weird kinky noise and then comes down over here. This one has gone into the artery and you can see it's now in the aorta you have successfully dilated the carotid artery and it's like you're doing a heart cath. This is not good. You cannot use this line if it's in an artery, but you can't take it out because remember that we dilated it very large. So this person is gonna bleed all over the place if you pull the line. No matter what your attending says, you make somebody else pull this line because of the risk factors. So I would just leave it, mark it as do not use and maybe attempt a line in the femoral area. Then I would call the vascular surgeon or the trauma surgeon or you were attending and say, hey, this line is in the artery. I told the nurses not to use it. Help me out here. And then they can help you from there. That's how I would handle those two situations. Again, remember, we don't want to pull the line out, even if it's in the wrong spot. We just don't want to use it. All right, let's move on to chest tubes. So the most common problem with chest tubes is misplacement of the tube. And that's because putting in this tube is actually really tricky. It's really hard to get it in appropriately. And then you're constantly messing with the tube to try to make sure that it's in the appropriate position. So one of the first things that you have to know is that the tube itself has something called an eye hole. You see this arrow here is pointing to it. That blue line shows up on x-ray as something that is a little white line, and then there's gonna be a break in that line, and that's indicating where that eye hole is. The eye hole is actually one of the most important radiological findings on the chest tube, because you want to make sure that that hole, not the tip, but that hole is actually in the chest wall. If it is not in the chest wall, let's say the break in the line was out here, that would mean that the tube is not in appropriately and it's not gonna be draining like it should. So you wanna make sure that it's on the inside part of the ribs. Okay, so now we've covered that. You wanna make sure the line itself is all the way in the ribs. You can see that this is actually just in the skin and it's not in the thoracic cavity at all. That's also a problem. Next is you can see that this line 
slash tube right here. Um, we can see the eye hole is right here, but it kind of swings around and comes back. Why does it do that? It's because the heart is sitting right here, right? So it's pushing against the heart. This can not only cause chest pressure or chest pain, it can cause all kinds of weird arrhythmias. It can cause the patient to not want to eat, drink, or go to sleep. And uh, it's something that you need to pay attention to because this may not be draining the way that we want it to drain. So maybe this line or tube needs to be pulled back a little bit, or maybe if it's not bothering the patient at this time, I would just leave it. And if it's not draining out appropriately, maybe they need to put in another line. Next is you can see this one has an eye hole here, but so this line seems to be in place, but you can see that the lung is still down and maybe you're getting a leak in the line. So maybe you don't have an airtight dressing or maybe suction is not on in the tubing system, that kind of stuff. Look outside the patient as well. If you look at all of that stuff and you still can't find a reason why this tube isn't working, do not take this tube out. Just like with the central line, we want to leave in the broken line or tube and you're going to go ahead and put in a tube just above it or just below it. And in this patient, I wouldn't put one below. I would put one above. A patient can have up to 10 tubes on one side. I know that's ridiculous, but some ICU patients end up needing that. So please, please leave the tube in, especially if it's in the wrong place and then go ahead and put in another tube. Now, I also want to show you this unfortunate case on the bottom here. This tube looks like it's in the right place, but for some reason it's not working. Now, obviously this patient died because this is a pathology picture, but what you can see here is the tube went through the actual lung tissue itself. So this person felt a whole lot of uh, resistance when they put in this line. This is pretty poor form, not something that you want to happen, and it's probably not helping this person's issues. So again, be aware of the resistance, be aware of misplaced tubes, especially things like weird kinks and lines or not being completely straight, okay? If you have a whole lot of questions, be sure to call your radiologist, ask a lot of questions to your attendings, you can always discuss it. People would always rather know about a potential problem than be worried that you're not telling them the whole truth. So please, please, please tell somebody if you're worried. I got to go through this here and delete all of these, unfortunately, so they don't go to the next slide. Okay, last but not least, lumbar puncture. So it's really important for you to know on this stuff that lumbar punctures are not life-threatening. And that's right. We don't do them a whole lot in the emergency department anymore because we have the beauty of CTs, which show bleeding very well. And it also usually shows ICP and ultrasound very well. So if you're in a room and you're not able to complete a lumbar puncture after about three different tries, stop torturing your patient and leave them alone. Some people are like, well, what if we're worried about meningitis? Then I would say, stop waiting for the test and just give them the antibiotics. Just treat them like it is, okay? People are more willing to admit, especially if you have a very convincing story and they've already been given antibiotics. Maybe IR needs to come down and do the lumbar puncture. This is not something to kill yourself or hurt your tor hurt or torture your patient over, okay? So if you can't get the lumbar puncture, move on. Now, you can have some problems as you're doing the lumbar puncture. Let's say you're going in and trying to find the spot and all of a sudden the patient tells you that they feel intense tingling or numbness or pain shooting down one of their legs. That means that you've gone in a little bit too far or too high. And this means that you need to pull out the needle immediately and reassess where you are on the patient. Next is they can have a headache from the CSF leak. And I think we all know post LP headaches are treated with caffeine, but it is something that the patient should be laying down right after an LP whenever possible. And you need to be very mindful of the bevel. Again, you're going to learn a lot more about this when we go over how to do a lumbar puncture. If not, please review that. 
And last is you need to maintain sterile field because you can give the patient meningitis, even though that's what you're looking for, if your sterile field is not maintained. So that means that you need at least gloves and iodine, and this should be done in a very nice secure setting. This should not be done on an altered mental status patient. This should not be done on a cerebral palsy patient or a tremulous patient who can't hold still for a lumbar puncture. There is almost no emergency I can think of where a lumbar puncture is needed right now. This is something that can be done later with IR or with neurology. So don't kill yourself over the lumbar puncture but beware of these problems. All right, so we've gone over all five procedures, a whole bunch of things that can go wrong and how to work around them. Remember that these are not an exclusive list. So think about it yourself as you're learning these procedures. What can go wrong? And if it can go wrong, know how to fix it. That's how you really master a procedure.